Hi everybody, welcome to another episode of the Future Tech podcast series where I get a chance, Charlie Sell, to speak with thought leaders, um, industry experts, people just passionate about STEM um, and careers in STEM. Um, for uh, many of our young people listening to the podcast and also with the STEM Ambassador Association where we share the episodes. So really pleased to have Joe Swan with me today. Joe is the Director of Engineering at CompareTheMarket.com um, and I presume many people know Compare the Market, but they are one of the UK's leading price comparison websites. And Joe and I were talking earlier and he'll expand on it um, more than likely, just how refreshing it is working for a business where their purpose is to save people money and, and that, that ethical uh, standpoint for when you work for a business that does good in the in the world, essentially. So, Joe, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And let's jump straight in. So, so tell us a bit about your story and how you got into technology. I uh, so I'm I'm one of the non traditional ones. Uh, so don't have a degree and um, did various things up to about sort of age twenty four, twenty five. Uh, so I'm just skimming over that. I mean. No one's interested in me working in call centres and pizza shops and other careers as I may have had. Um, so about about 25, most, mostly self-taught, uh, managed to get a job with a um, startup. And I'd, I'd got an amount of uh, experience by going to the library, practising uh, a bit of computing, and they just needed someone to cobble together some websites for them and I could just about cobble together websites they didn't pay very much they didn't expect very much so kind of got into it that way uh, after doing that for oh, we less than a year managed to uh, get a job as a support analyst for one of the big businesses at the time which is Capita I think they're they're still quite a big business I think they they go in waves of whether they're a big business or a, a, a medium to large business uh, and mostly what I was doing was uh, second third line support for applications manually copying log files from servers onto other disks to then put onto tapes to then take the tapes and put into a different site because this was the um, early 2000s and um, it was still physical backups. There were lots of software developers in the same office as me. It was, it was the time where open plan offices were becoming a new thing and we all got on really well and they kept sort of showing me different things that they were doing. It turned out I could do some of that. Um, applied for a job, got turned down because they didn't turn support analysts into developers and so went somewhere else, found a different startup. Um, and then the rest of my career kind of follows that kind of trajectory. The the second place uh, well, the, the, that startup I went to was actually a sort of biomedical startup but mostly did brochureware for biomedical, uh, did a few bits of software for like smoking cessation mm -hmm. services, helping people stop smoking. And that was really fun to work at because it was helping people through technology, which was quite a surprise to me because I thought, you know, computer programmers just got paid lots of money to do anything that they wanted and, and this was actually genuinely helping people. After a few years there, decided to try my hand at contracting. Um, and uh, sort of meandered about the contracting. Funnily enough, ended up contracting for Capita for a few years, um, who after a two year period with their contractors, they, they just cut you and, and set you loose into the world. So I went and contracted for another big um, consultancy at the time that was the, the field of expertise I was doing, which was BizTalk and SharePoint and immediately got deployed on a Capita project. So Capita seemed to feature along quite a bit. Uh, then, then after that, did some work for some local councils. We'd moved to Leeds by that point, uh, grew up in Nottingham, lived in Nottingham, and then uh, moved to Leeds uh, with my now wife, um, at, at the time, my, my girlfriend. Uh, moved to Leeds and ended up working for Leeds City Council. Uh, which was quite interesting, uh, again, as a consultant, but working on some of their systems, 
that was incredibly rewarding because that was helping their social care and their social workers be more efficient and reduce the amount of time it took them to be effective. So especially in a 24-7 service looking after vulnerable young people, helping them out was just incredible. Uh, that came to an end when I decided to um, become a father and we had our first child. So I went to get a permanent job and crazily went to work for a startup. Stayed there for about 10 months. It didn't quite work out for me. It wasn't the right thing and ended up um, working for Sky for about six years. Uh, the story of working for Sky was um, uh, a friend of mine was going to one of their sort of meetup stroke recruitment events that we used to have before COVID where they buy you with pizza and free beer and then sort of the recruiters would come and talk to you and everything else. Uh, and I got into, uh, we'll just call it what it is, got into an argument with a principal engineer about the right way to do something and uh, for the entirety of my career at Sky, we always called a discussion with principal engineers an argument, um, like you know, a collection of principal engineers is often an argument. Um, and thought, right, well, I won't be working for them and woke up the next day with about three messages on LinkedIn saying, right, I want you to talk to this recruiter. The recruiter got in touch with me and said, look, you had a really good discussion with this person. Um, went in for an interview, ended up working for Sky for six years, worked on Sky Glass, uh, the launch of Sky Glass, which was really interesting. Um, and during that time, I um, was mentored by someone who was my boss's boss, she was the director of the area that we're in. And she left the business to go to work for Compare the Market. And I, after finishing the work at Sky Glass, went back to being principal engineer. Um, we'd moved to Northumberland. This time we were, my wife was pregnant with our third child and we were planning on having a fourth. And Sky was based in Leeds. I didn't really fancy a 120 mile each way commute. So I uh, started reaching out to my connections and there was one person that I really wanted to work with, which was uh, Renee, who um, you know quite well. Uh, so I rang her up and went, I want to work for you. I don't care what the job is. Have you got anything? And she said, well, you'll have to go through the process. You have to go through assessments. They're quite tough assessments. It's very difficult. You'll feel very disassembled and put back together again um, and I have had mental health issues so she was being fair and warning me uh, and then she went yeah and you know that will result in, a, in an associate director's role and so I went through all the assessments where you have to go through with clinical psychologists assessing your numerical skills your inductive and deductive reasoning uh, competency based questions how, how you approach people it's all very very sort of rigorous. Then you have interviews with senior stakeholders in the business to be able to get in, so then you have to talk to C-level people. All very, very frightening for someone who'd been an engineer up until that point. Um, it worked, and then a director role became available after about four-ish months in the role. Had to go through that entire process again. They they don't mess you about, into, uh, like they don't treat internal different to external, you have to go through the process. This time it was um, just one clinical psychologist taking me through that process, but still a challenge. And yeah, ended up as the engineering director and I'm working on some fantastic technology, uh, some fantastic things for our customers. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll read out our purpose and strategy because I, I should have it tattooed on my arm or committed to memory, but uh, it it's... Uh, the summer holidays and there's four kids rattling around the house and um, so uh, excuse me if my memory is not working so we exist to make financial decision making a breeze for everyone and our strategy is to create an automated quoting engine with the simplest of experiences wrapped in the brands that everyone loves and that's the kind of marketing aspect for me it's I joined compare the market because I wanted to work primarily with someone who was a great mentor for me um, but also, I didn't need to move away from Sky. I had no desire. And the thing that dragged me across and, and got me to take this huge, just huge change in, in career trajectory was the fact that every penny that we make is only made when we help someone 
save money and in a cost of living crisis and as, as someone who's very caring and empathetic about people's mental health and situation being able to move to a company being given the challenge to make that happen and then starting to succeed in it is is just absolutely humbling and amazing for me to do so yeah so that's my potted history engineer 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 uh management that's <laughs> that's, that's a simple simple way but yeah well i mean you know there's so much to be able to take from that um that, that story everything from the the differences of working for yeah a large stroke medium to large businesses like capita to startups the 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 value of getting a mentor and, and, and how that can really help you progress your career, but also that step from from engineer to management, to leadership and, and, and what that looks like. So, you know, lots to pick up on there. But maybe if I start with the first question, which, yeah, how have you found that step from, from being an engineer and, and, and moving into that leadership role, which is, you know, relatively quite new then if it's been within the last year or so. How have you found that? How does it, yeah. Uh, quite simply terrifying, <laughs> terrifying. Uh, so I started in about June last year and uh, moved into the director role about October. Um, also, I didn't mention that uh, in, in that period where I, I stepped up in October, I also took over data engineering for about six months while we were looking for a data engineering director. So. I applied for a director role and ended up with two, which really amplified some of the challenges. Absolutely terrifying. Um, I, I, I recently uh, spoke at our quarterly strategy update, and in fact, it's one of the most important ones, which is the one that starts the year. Our, our year runs uh, uh, July to June each year. And for the first time ever, uh, myself and one of the other directors people at director level were asked to be on stage to talk about their experiences and I gave a talk about how I just I felt like a complete imposter um, I didn't want to be in charge of people uh, I really like Simon Sinek's you know people are in your charge you're there to lead them guide them mentor them help them you're not there to be a sat nav and say right you're going to that destination and you're taking all of these roads and if you deviate from it i'm going to whinge at you because you're taking too long that's not not the kind of thing i wanted to do so i had to learn very quickly that uh, answers like i don't know or it's the engineer's choice or go and ask the people who are doing it were acceptable and it took a while to kind of get this business that had lots of plans but always kind of rebaseline to the plans and rebaseline the plans and rebaseline the plans to operate based on belief and strategy. And in fact, going into this year, we have goals, we have ideas of what we want to achieve. We kind of know they're possible, but we're not quite sure yet how to do them. And the, the real fun there is getting people into the mindset of, will work it out like if it's a now problem we solve the now problem if it's a future problem we'll solve it in the future and uh, and yeah so that that's helped release some of that that anxiety around deadlines and delivery and everything else is, is to really just be there to guide people and say just go in this direction yeah. don't worry about the exact plan just go in this direction and if it works it works if it doesn't go in this direction instead yeah and i think you know that's such a good point because you you are so right you know lead, sometimes people forget that leadership or or management is not about directives and and you know telling people what to do it's, it's giving them the space to learn but with the with the safety net of a, a great mentorship and, and, and guidance and uh, personally I'm a massive fan of what I call subservient leadership where really as leaders we're here to serve our, our people not the other way around and if we do it right people flourish people grow and, and companies that embrace that which it sounds really clearly like uh, compared the market does you only build a, a much more productive culture don't you it's the, it's the culture that's key to, to progression I guess 
it is it is and it's it's making people safe to understand that mistakes can happen and actually i would prefer people to try hundreds or thousands of different things and most if not all of them fail because then we know what doesn't work and if we know what doesn't work we're not laboring over something that will never actually bring us value and the more you try the better probability of actually getting there and uh, and and just what you were saying yeah the the, the servant leader and subservient leaders uh, again another simon sinek quote is uh, you know my job is to take all of the crap and none of the credit and that helps people feel safe knowing that if there is a problem i'll work out i'll deal with the problem i'll deal with the emotional responses and the stresses and they can just work at doing their job which is solving the problem yeah. and and so they feel very empowered to take a risk yeah 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 fantastic and you also mentioned uh, you know earlier about how your career has been you know from from capita big large businesses um uh then contracting and then startups a couple of times what lessons have you learned or or thoughts have you got about try experiencing those different types of businesses i think i think it's all about the mindset so the gen, generally the bigger the business the more established the processes within that business so if you're going to go in not everything is up for change now i've been called a disruptor in the past i've been called disruptive in the past and so i i always see everything as tradable <clears throat> however you have a lot more freedom in a startup so when i worked in a startup we would we would do everything from work out what we need to build then go and build it, then actually deploy it, put it in front of customers, measure the performance, talk about the problems and go back to the start. In bigger businesses, some of those roles, some of those processes are a bit more sort of partitioned up. And we we do see companies like Sky and, and Now TV and, and the big tech companies, they have a DevOps mindset. But in a startup, you're running the platform, you're the infrastructure engineer, you're the DevOps engineer, you're, you're everything. And it's, it's, it's learning all of those skills versus if you want to hone your craft and be the best C sharp or the best Java engineer and just focus on that thin slice, but get a really deep depth of knowledge working for some of the bigger companies can give you the opportunity to focus down more because they like depth of expertise and predictability. Startups like breadth of expertise and unpredictability. So, and, and there are companies that sort of merge the two uh, to varying successes. Yeah. And you also talk, you know, thank you for being quite open, you know, that, that mental health is something important to you. And, and, you know, when I'm speaking with a lot of young people and we're doing a lot of mentoring through the STEM Ambassador Association, and, and one thing that is so prevalent, and, and I'm really happy that young people are now able to talk about anxiety more and, and their mental health and, and the worries that they have, whereas, you know, when I was you know, entering the workplace, it was it was almost a, a taboo if you even mentioned that you you were you know you're feeling anxious or you had, you know, you weren't yourself. How is there any strategies that you could share or things that you've dealt with? You know, if a young person's feeling, you know, they're, they're, they've got that those stresses, those worries. How how did you deal with it, or or is there any sort of simple? Process? Yeah, <clears throat> um, so. So there's a variety of things. Um, my, I'll start with my experience, um, if it's relatable to people. It, it probably won't be relatable to everyone. My experience is PTSD, and it was only actually this year that I finally got the right therapy that I needed for PTSD, which was uh, just mind-boggling how quickly it actually worked. So. 20 plus years of challenges with PTSD uh, were gone in 
weeks um, due to a therapy called EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization response, which is essentially conscious REM sleep. So you're in a state of consciousness, but your brain is processing things as though you're in REM sleep and you talk through and think through your experiences while this is happening. And it helps the brain process the emotional memories. They dissipate quickly, create new pathways, and then a lot of the other trauma that you've stored disappears very quickly, which was great. But then it left me just, you know, with with stan standard depression and anxiety, uh, for which I take medication, have uh, counselling, have people to talk to. For anyone else, get in touch with your doctor, get in touch with your local mental health service, get in touch with your friends or family. Um, I'm sorry to say um, that one of the biggest killers of men in the UK is themselves which is just a frightening fact. Suicide is huge and it is, the majority of it is mental health related. For women, there's a lot more coping with it, but then that's, that's almost worse because they suffer for longer. Um, with suicide, everyone else suffers. With surviving suicide, you and other people suffer. And it's, it's just such a, such a challenging thing. These days, most employers give you mental health days, mental health support. We have at Compare the Market in Sky, we have mental health first aiders. And so the first, the first thing to do is talk to people, talk to your own line manager. If your line manager is not being supportive, go and talk to HR. It's, it's something that can be addressed. It's something that you can get help with. You can get help coping with it, you can get help getting over it, and you can learn to live with it, you can learn to live with the challenges. I'm not going to be one of these people that will ever say that it just gets fixed and goes away. And I still, you know, even, even though I'm massively improved on the sort of PTSD symptoms, they're still there occasionally because it's been trained into some of my behaviours. But there is there is such a wealth of information available and the the first thing is just to talk about it because from my experience my career in hindsight was probably held back due to the fact that i was having these mental health issues that caused me to be inconsistent with my behaviors and people saw a side of me that I'm glad to say has mostly disappeared now and I don't ever want to be in that position where that person who makes other people feel uncomfortable or feel inferior or feel um, feel that then they'll never be as good or, or that I, I somehow am aggressive towards them. Um, just having that in your past just reminds you that it's it's worth talking about and the most important thing is to just is, is to take that step and talk about it and it is it is the hardest step but it's the most important one yeah thank you so much for sharing that because it i i know for a fact it will resonate with so many people um and, and just having senior people like yourself and and um you know myself being able just to talk about it on an open platform like this goes such a long way of making it not a taboo, making it a, you know, something that we can share. And um, so thank you. That, that was you know, really, really, really insightful. And so moving on then to, to, to some of the career advice for young people. And we were, we were having a good chat yesterday, weren't we, about, um, you know, how do we get from young people into the teams and, and spreading diversity? And I know diversity is a huge thing on your yes. agenda. Um, and so the whole point of this podcast is, is about, making sure young people realise that STEM and careers in, well, careers in anything, but for this podcast into STEM should be open to all. And, and if we can if we can feed the funnel at the entry level, it will support and, and you know, improve um, the diversity, equity, inclusion across all career levels over the coming years. What career advice, what, what one or two bits of advice would you give our young people who may not have that degree, that formal education, similar to, to, to yourself, 
how can they step how can they get that foot in the door it's it's really challenging i think industry has changed and is more interested in practical experience than theoretical experience and I, I mean this in the most sincere way to everyone that's gone to university and, and got the degree and got the qualification. Um, but what that mostly shows to me as an employer is that you can do the work that's asked of you, do research, do it on time and do it to a good quality. And if we extract that for people that don't have a degree, how can you show that you can do the work that's asked of you, do it on time, and do it to a good quality. Go go and work at Curry's, Dixon's, wherever sells computers these days, um, online and uh, sorry, in in store and have a job where you can show that you can do a task, you can do the task to the time, to the quality that's asked of you. That's that's what we're interested in. Also, what's much more interesting these days is how much we index on behavior and um, most importantly soft skills because diversity diversity sometimes falls into the stereotypes of we need more women because they have better soft skills and they'll teach all of our very sort of boring male engineers with no hair and a white and wear glasses and all the rest of it um, you know, the soft skills that they need to succeed, and that's falling into the stereotypes. So forget about the stereotypes, but think about why people are trying to get diversity in. Different experiences, different ways of thinking, different lived experience, and different understanding and focus on the world um, helps all of us. When we're having discussions that compare the markets, there are people who have very fortunate backgrounds, which no one holds a grudge against, and the people who have not so fortunate backgrounds, who can probably relate more to some of the struggles that we're, we're seeing uh, with the rate shock in, in the insurance market. And so we can understand what drives people to do different things. But if everyone thinks the same, if ignoring gender, race, Else. I mean, I'm actually actually wearing my uh, Pride T-shirt at the moment because it's, it's the one I like to wear when I'm, I'm talking um, to be supportive. Is irregardless of that, if everyone thinks the same, looks the same, talks the same, the product is going to just apply to that demographic. Maybe if everyone that buys insurance happens to look and talk and sound like me, then that's be a winner. But we know that the world is a diverse place, so we want to make diverse products. Get, getting into technology, don't compare yourself to an experience or a person or something that you've never experienced. For years and years and years, I've compared myself to graduates and I don't have that lived experience, so I don't know how they think, what they've done, how they've gone through it. And that comparison caused me a lot of angst. And instead, compare yourself to yourself. You don't have to aim to be someone else. Aim every day to be a little bit different, to learn something new, do something better, find a cooler way of doing that task. I, I call it the lazy developer. Like the person who does the most automation is the laziest person in the world because they want to do nothing. But then they've done all the automation, so it's all done and we get massive productivity out of it. Um, but compare yourself to yourself. Look back over the last six months. What have you achieved? Are you in control of that? How do you get control of that? And 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 don't don't get put off by the fact that someone else has a different lived experience because your lived experience is yours, and you should use that to be the best version of you. And that's what's important. Yeah, I think that's such, such good advice. And, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, everything you've mentioned, because uh, I remember yesterday we were also speaking about how sometimes when we look at diversity and, and sometimes there's an unfair pedestal that we say, okay, we have a diverse team which may be led 
by by a female or by someone from a di- a, a, you know different social economic background. And then the challenge might be is they have to be the perfect person, whereas everyone else in the team yeah. can be a sixty percent fit because it's the you know it's it's there's that microscope on them or, or what they're doing. And, and true diversity, true equity is about understanding that people have different levels and how do we level that so it's a level playing field. Exactly, exactly. And, and uh, I talked about my mental health challenges and how that makes being consistent, yet somehow I've I've made it to where I am now. And I, I want someone else who who doesn't have this profile to be able to do the same thing and have challenges and overcome them and not feel like they then have to be perfect all the time to set the example for all the other people. It's it's so unfair to um, hire people in and then hold them to a higher standard as everyone else when in fact you know we shouldn't lower the bar, we should be turning around and saying to everyone else why aren't you as good as this person and give that person the same advice here's here's someone who's performing the task in the way that we expected how can you perform the task now this is this is the bit that i always get stuck on and struggle to explain but it's it's the performing of the task not how you perform the task you should all be everyone should have dignity at work and as long as you're respecting dignity at work how you perform the task is irrelevant and you need to focus on the task being done because if you try and perform that task the way that someone else does it do they think differently to you do they act differently to you do they have a different experience and that can be one way that people really struggle with is oh i see that person they're so successful i'll try and emulate them and the reason why they're successful is not because of how they think it's because they they're looking at the solution the 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 goals the criteria and and you have to apply your own way of doing things otherwise you just end up in this being a facsimile of someone else and and a copy is never as good as the original yeah wow thank you and and, you know time has flown by this has been such an interesting um episode and and Everything we've discussed from, you know, the the, the, chat, the leadership and, and and what we've learned. And I'm also a massive fan of Simon Selleck. I think so many of his examples and his stories um, uh, resonate. And then um, the startups versus large businesses, mental health. You know, we've, we've covered so much. So, so Joe, thank you so much for being on the uh, on the episode on the show. Uh, th- thank you for having me, and, and thank you for for. For giving me the freedom to to do what I do best, which is to come on and talk about something that's probably not quite what people are expecting. Um, it's 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 been a great opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Brilliant. And so to our listeners, that's another episode of the Future Tech Podcast. Um, as many people know, it's shared with the STEM Ambassador Association, and it is also on the Arrows Group forward slash podcast. Uh, website. So this is another episode of Future Tech. Thank you to everyone. And once more, thank you to Joe. Cool. Thank you so much.